evening, everybody. Welcome to the forum for our Norwich City fans forum. And there's no better place to have a forum than at the forum, is there? So it's great to see so many of you here. We're going to bring our guests onto the stage in just a moment, but I want them to get a good sense of what sort of a crowd we've got in tonight. So first of all, how many Norwich fans have we got here? Now, come on, this is the first time you've got to meet the new head coach, and that's the best you can do. <laughs> how many Norwich fans have we got in here? That's more like it. Make you feel welcome. The next question I've got to ask you all, is it coming home? Yeah. That, that didn't sound very convincing. I'll ask you one more time. Is it coming home? Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not. No, <laughs> I don't think I'm buying it from that. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm uh, Chris Gorham from BBC Radio Norfolk, and I do the breakfast show and commentate on all of Norwich City's matches. So I'm hoping there's plenty to get excited about over the next 10 months or so. We'll find out because we've got the people who are hopefully going to make that happen with us tonight. The way this evening is going to work, uh, we're lucky enough to have three of the uh, very important people from Norwich City Football Club with us tonight. We've got Ben Napper, we've got Zoe Weber, and we've got the new head coach, Johannes Hovtorov, who we'll bring up onto the stage in just a moment. Uh, we'll start by having uh, a few questions that I've thought to ask them and get to know them a little bit and find out what's been going on at Carrow Road over the summer since we last saw them. And then after that, it's over to you. So if you've got a question that you'd like to ask, have a think about it now. Maybe something will occur to you during our initial chat. If you've got a question to ask, put your hands up when we get to that point. Jack, who's at the back there, give us a wave, Jack. There he is, that's Jack. He is gonna have the task of racing around the room with the microphone. So when he comes to you, if it's gonna be your question, if you're able to, it'd be great if you could stand up so, so that A, he can pick you out, and B, he can get the microphone to you. And don't worry about taking the microphone off him. He'll hold it, and he'll get it nice and close so that we can all hear you right around the room and we can get your questions answered. So, are you ready to meet our team tonight? If I could just add, this is being recorded tonight to be broadcast later on the radio, so can we make sure phones are on silent, please, as well? Feel free to take photos and uh, tweet and all the rest of it, but just make sure your phone's on silent. So let's welcome onto the stage here your panel for this evening. Uh, delighted to have them with us at a very busy time. We've got with us Zoe Weber, Ben Napper, and Johannes Hoftorup. Here's our, our panel for this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great to, to have them all with us. Uh, don't get distracted if Anthony, our colleague Anthony, comes up and just fiddles with the microphones a bit. Don't take that personally. He's just making sure that we can, we can hear you all. So let, let's hear from somebody we're all meeting for the first time tonight. I know you've all been really keen to hear what he's got planned uh, for your football club, uh, the new head coach, Norwich City, Johannes. Great to see you. What, what's it like sitting before your, your new supporters, your Norwich City fans? For the f it's the first time you've seen them. What do you think? Yeah, do they look friendly? Uh, at least they're smiling, I would say so. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I think this is an okay start. Um, to be fair, I've met a lot of them already, um, which has been fantastic. I had, a, I had a long walk, was it last weekend, I think? I just walked around the city to see every, every neighborhood and more or less every place, and I, I met a lot of the fans on my way, so uh, it's been fantastic so far. So what sort of things were they saying to you? you? You've already had fans coming up and asking you questions, have you? Yeah, please work hard, they said. Um, no, it was more or less just making me feel welcome and um, asking about the start and... and how I feel in the city and, and you know, stuff like that. So, uh, no, ni nice welcome and, and nice people. So, That's good. Nothing, nothing crazy. You, you, let's see if you still feel the same at the end of the night once you've had the, had the yeah, questions yeah, yeah. from, from one of the see, people as see. well. Uh, we've got Zoe Weber with us as well. Zoe, good to have you here. You're, you're here to answer the, not so much the football related questions, but the, the business side of the club and how that's been going. And the summer we're in at the moment, it's the first time for quite a while that, as a football club, Norwich City haven't had Premier League money or, or parachute payments. So, does that mean it's a, a different summer to, to what it has been? Um, not especially, because we always work to kind of a three-year plan anyway. So, we, we plan for this eventuality. And, you know, we've, Ben and I have spent a lot of time over the last kind of eight months since he came in having those conversations about about what this looks like. So, I mean, any any summer, irrespective of whether you've, you know, got money, haven't got money, there's always work to be done and, and transactions to be done, maybe slightly, you know, different values involved, but, but yeah, it, it doesn't overly change it. 
Uh, and Ben, from your point of view, what have you made of the way Johannes has started? And I know it's very difficult for the, for the fans because we're not seeing anything at the moment. We're, we're not seeing any evidence of this on the pitch. So it's very difficult for us, to, for us to form opinions at the moment. But how do you feel the summer is progressing? Yeah, really positive. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of optimism and positivity around the club, which is great. I think uh, hopefully everyone feels um, excited about kind of the next journey that we're going to go on. I know I certainly do. And uh, yeah, obviously it was uh, an eager wait over the off season for the, you know, for the first session. I think we've had a, a great week last week, uh, which was fantastic because, you know, all the planning and strategizing and and thinking about what it's going to be like, you, you, you're just so excited to actually get out on the grass and start to work. And I think uh, the lads that we've got back in at the moment have been um, really pleased with, with the week we've had. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of whets the appetite for the season ahead, really. So, so far, so good. Yeah, I think um, that there is a real sense of excitement around supporters, isn't there? Are you excited about the season? Yeah, you see, positive, that's good to hear. Um, but before we talk about the season ahead, Ben, we ought to draw a line under last season. We're not going to spend too much time going over last season, but it's the first time the fans have had to, to hear from you really since then. So I've been trying to get my head around the last 12 months in the life of Norwich City and just how eventful it's been, because there was a similar event to this last summer. And I think if we'd stood on the stage a year ago and told that the fans who were here that night that in the next 12 months Norwich would have a top six finish, they wouldn't lose to Ipswich, and they would go six months unbeaten at home, everybody would have said, oh, I'll buy into that, that's a great season. But what have you learned about what football fans really want? Because despite all of those things I've just said, they're all true, but there was still a feeling of dissatisfaction, wasn't there? So what do you think football supporters actually want from their team? Because we always say it's a results business. Is it, is it more than that? I think the game, the modern game, has changed a little bit in that respect. Um, you know, I think what everyone in this room wants, to be honest, is, this, is the same as me, like uh, above all else, I'm a football fan as well. Um, so of course, we, we all wanna see our team win and be successful, but you know, there's a way that you wanna see that happen as well. And I think more and more in the modern game, that's uh, becoming more and more important. Um, and it's, it's important because that's what helps you become sustainable over a, a long period of time, because you know, in order to win consistently over a prolonged period, you, you have to be playing in a certain way that gives you the best chance of doing that. Like football at the end of the day is a game of, of probabilities, to be honest. Um, and it's about trying to stack the probabilities in your favor. And you, you have to do that by playing in a certain way that, you know, sometimes even with a, a fantastic performance, you know, you can lose and, and that happens. But it's about trying to play in a certain way that, that stacks the probabilities in your favor. Um, and, you know, I think fans want to see an attractive brand of football. That's exactly the same as me. So, yeah, that's no different. Um, you know, the, of course, we want to win and we want to be successful. But the way in which we do it is also important, not just because of how it looks and feels, but because that gives you more chance of being successful over a longer period of time as well. So, so what do you want? I mean, we just had the election and, and change is the big buzzword at the moment, isn't it? We're, we're told that's what everyone wants, change. So what changes do you want to see at, when, when fans turn up at Carrow Road this season in terms of I mean, results? Of course, you want Norwich to be winning, but in terms of the approach of the team, because you, you had six months to watch it last season and clearly you felt the new direction was needed. So talk me through that new direction. Yeah, I think what I would hope that we deliver, and, it, and it, it's what we will deliver, it's, it's a responsibility we take really seriously, is to, to, to create a team and to deliver a team for all of you guys that, that represents you, that is consistent, that you understand exactly what you're going to see every week. And it's a team that you can relate to, because I think I've lived through situations in the past, in, in previous points in my career, where if you lose that, it's very difficult to create the kind of connection that we want to create between our, our fans, our supporters, and, and, and us and the team. So in order to build that connection and make it strong, we need to deliver consistent themes that, you know, in difficult moments, in great moments, when we're winning, when we're, when we're suffering, you can still see those, those commonalities in the way that we approach the game, the way that we're trying to play, and the behaviors that we exhibit on the pitch, in training, off the pitch, everything that we do has to be something that relates to you guys, that represents you all, um, and, and this obviously great city, and, and that's the thing that we'll be focusing on going forward, and that new direction, I think, will be embodied by um, an attacking, really proactive approach to games. Um, again, Johannes has spoken about this before, but whether we're away from home against a top team, whether we're at home against a, a, a perceived um, 
lesser team. Um, we'll approach the game always with the ambition to try and dominate, to try and control the game, to try and score the next goal. And, and I think that's a big thing that, that we take seriously to deliver. So I think that's certainly a big focus in terms of game model, playing style, um, and what you can expect to see from us. Talk me through what made you decide that this man on stage with us was the man to bring all that, though. Because you, you've had this task over the summer and before that as well of identifying the next head coach and, and bringing him in. So I know it's difficult when he's here listening to you, but why, what was it about the, him that, uh, that appealed? Ah, look, so much. Um, yeah, when I thought about the, the kind of head coach that I think we need to, to, to really drive the next phase of our journey, Johannes ticks all of those boxes. Um, he's coming from a, a wonderful organization himself where he's got a clear track record of delivering exactly the style of play that, 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 that we're looking to move forward with. Um, you know, the fact that he's been a head coach and actually delivered that before is, is important as well. There's, of course, lots of clubs take the decision to maybe go with a, an assistant coach that might be taking their first job. And, and whilst, you know, that's absolutely a viable strategy, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to go with a head coach that has actually got a sample that we could refer to with some real conviction that we could say that's what he delivered rather than this is what he will deliver if he's a head coach for the first time. So that was important, and again, he, a really demonstrable track record of, of playing in a certain way, being successful with it, developing players for the highest level, which is important. Um, you know, he's used to working in a structure that's similar to ours with a, with a sporting or, or a technical director. Um, you know, he's, a, he's somebody that I've spoken about before, is, is on an upward trajectory that's, that's really important for me. I think it's a little bit like myself, to be honest. Um, you know, I, Certainly don't feel that I'm anywhere near the finished article. There's so much development in me, and, and, and I like that kind of um, dynamic for, for anyone, to be honest, in the club, not just the head coach, but for lots of people. We, we want people that are hungry to prove, um, that feel like they've got everything to, to achieve, and, and, and that's certainly Johannes. And, and, of course, in the conversations that we had, I started to learn more and more about this in him. So, yeah, he, he embodies a lot of, of, of what I think we need going forward, and, and he was the, the clear choice. So, Johannes, Ben has said some nice things about you. What's he been like as a boss so far? <laughs> <laughs> that was a look that said a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it, it's, it's been very good. Uh, I would say everything I was told before starting here is, is, is what I see. Uh, we are very open-minded. It's a, it's a club where we think so much about how we can develop, how we can improve, uh, what the next step will be. Uh, never really being satisfied with the situation, but always looking to improve and see where we can we can get better. Um, but still, with that uh, with that great feeling inside the club, where we listen to each other, um, uh, we get feedback from each other, and we also use each other to become better. And that's that's what we spoke about before me joining, and that, that's that's definitely what I see. Both from now, you just asked specifically about Ben, but there, there's there's so many others. Uh, but also from the players is what I've, I've seen so far. Now, the, the big thing that supporters have to think about now, and we don't, we don't like thinking about it because we just want to turn up and watch our team play on a Saturday and Tuesday and Wednesday and whenever we want to see them play on the pitch, but the financial state of the club and what's possible within budgets is always important for everyone to understand. So I think we'll bring you in here, Zoe. J just how would you sum up the financial position of, of the football club at the moment? Um, I, th I mean, I think we're, we're in a, a, a solid position. Um, I think Mark, Mark coming in has enabled us to keep any debt within our kind of ownership structure, which obviously um, puts us in a much stronger position than if you're you know, being financed by a third party. So we're in a, um, a, a really good position. I think that the, the challenge for any football club in the championship is obviously financial control. So, uh, so you know, we have to work to the Football League's P&S rules. So anything that we do has to kind of build into that. And again, a bit like how we plan for three years, that works on a three-year cycle as well. So we kind of have to balance off meeting P&S, managing our own, our own cash flows. Um, but I think, like you know, like I said before, you know, it's not a surprise, and and so, 
you know, we spend, Ben and I spend a lot of time with our FD constantly modeling, constantly looking at, you know, we've spent time looking at what the, what, you know, the guys would like to do, how we can achieve that, what that looks like, how that then fits with cash flow, how that, you, you know, looks with, um, looks with PNS and, and, you know, we, we identify what those priorities are, what comes first, you know, and it might be, right, well, we can do this, but if you want to do this, we're going to have to sell one or, you know. So, so there's a lot of kind of modelling around trying to achieve what they want to achieve rather than it being, right, this is your budget. It's actually what do you want to try and achieve and then how can we try and make that happen? A couple of interesting points there. We'll come back to Mark Atanasio and his whether his role has changed in a moment. But you're, it's interesting now football clubs, and we've seen some fall foul of some of the rules you're talking about and have points deductions. So that's something else that you're working within now. Just talk to us a little bit about that, if you can, as to how close Norwich are to being within those rules at the moment and why that is such a big, a big subject over the summer. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's become a big subject um, because I think some clubs, I mean, like I said, you know, I think we're, we'll, we kind of know our PNS position for this year. We know our PNS, what our PNS position would be for next year and the following year. So we always sort of forward look so that nothing that we do now is going to make us fall foul of those rules in, in the future. I think possibly with some other clubs, they've not rolled it forward. Um, and and sort of almost then got caught out by the position the position that they've been in so it it is difficult there is there's a lot of conversations at the moment amongst the premier league and the efl um around changing those financial controls uh and following a, a model that uefa are looking to bring in for for european competition so you know, again, we're kind of following that closely and actually, you know, does that create a little bit more headroom to be able to do a bit more? Um, and, and we'll see what that looks like. Is that frustrating, though, if you're working with one set of rules that you expect to be in place for the next three years and it might all change? It, it, you, you have, yeah, you have to adapt. And it's a bit, you know, like the position we're in. Sometimes you're, you know, we were in the playoffs. You're kind of like, right you know, still in the middle of May, not knowing what your budget is going to be for next year, what what you can do. Um, so quite often you're running two different scenarios, you're running two different plans, uh, you know, it'll be, can we do that work? Well, we can do that work if, if X happens, if we, you know, if not, it's Y. Um, so we constantly have to be really agile and really responsive. And, and some of that comes back to, you know, developing models that we can kind of plug in those different variables and it kind of gives us the outcomes and, and we know what we can do. So I, I know the question that fans will be thinking, so I'll try and translate it. I don't know whether Zoe or Ben is best to answer this, but when you're trying to stay within financial rules and we know what Norwich City have done traditionally as a football club, does that mean selling players? Does it mean that this summer you're looking at it thinking, look, if we're going to stay within these rules, one of these players, and we all know who the key players are, who gets talked about all the time, one of those is probably going to have to go. Is that the reality? Well, yeah, like I've said before, sort of uh, this club with, with our approach and, and certainly kind of my approach going forward is that we, we would always have that expectation and pressure on ourselves, regardless of any situation around PNS or, or, or anything else. Um, in order to be a, a club that, again, can be successful, not just a flash in the pan with a, with a good season or, or, or two here or there, if, if we're trying to grow incrementally in the way that we are to, to become, hopefully one day, an established Premier League club, then selling players is absolutely an essential part of that. Um, you know, it's a key part of, of, of running a successful football operation. You can't get away from that. So, you know, whether you've got um, uh, any pressure because of PNS or not, that's a, an imperative part of any football strategy that we've run in the past and that we will run going forward. Um, so look, we're, we're in a good position because, yeah, we've got, we've got players that the market um, are really interested in and, and that's the position that you want to be in as a football club because it shows that we've got some really talented players. Um, you know, if we were arriving at summer windows with, with the phone not calling and nobody interested in any of our players, we'd be a lot more concerned. Um, that's where we want to be. That's where we are. Um, but, you know, from our perspective, 
it's clear, you know, we, we'll only engage in those kinds of conversations if it's going to be the right thing for us and if we achieve, um, you know, the kind of conditions with any kind of deal that, that are acceptable for us. So that, that's the pressure that we put on ourselves regardless of anything else. And, and Zoe, just to bring back to what you said about Mark Atanasio, it was a, a long wait, wasn't there, for his involvement with the club to be officially ratified. It has been. So what's his day-to-day sort of -day role, if there is one, with the club now? How often are you speaking to him? And I think there was even talk of him investing in other clubs, wasn't there? Benfica were mentioned. What, just update us on, on that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I think now Mark and Delia and Michael have kind of parity of shareholding it kind of almost hasn't changed much per se because uh, Mark's been really heavily involved uh, even when he had a, a lesser shareholding at the beginning. Um, ben and I talk to him regularly, I think you more so uh, on the football side, particularly during, during the season. But, you know, he was heavily involved, uh, you know, in Ben's appointment. Uh, you know, we... we meet with him at least at least once a month as a as a group uh, he attends all our board meetings uh, he's kind of always on the end of the phone if you know if, if we want to talk about something or discuss something he has regular dialogue with Delia and Michael so so whilst I suppose he's not hugely fan visible because um, you know they, they don't get to get to come across too much I think he's very visible to us within the club um, and and yeah I, I know that yeah there, there's been some talk about um, interest in interest in other clubs uh, and I had I had a conversation with him on, on the back of it because obviously we had quite a lot of <laughs> press inquiries and and he you know his his position very much is that you know they they will always explore opportunities they're an investment company you know they they will always explore opportunities but any opportunities are very much on an individual basis and, and nothing he you know he would do in in his other investments would ever have sort of affect his commitment to the club uh, let's bring in Johannes the head coach who's got the players back I don't know if you've seen the pictures on the Norwich website but the players have been back in for pre-season training they're not all back yet they're coming back in uh, at different times because a lot of them have had international commitments so how is it going so far you've got to meet some of your players for the first time what, what did you how do you make a good first impression what, what do you say to them as a, as a head coach that must be interesting <laughs> yeah yeah and um and actually to be fair I wanted to say a lot but uh, also just to to make sure that they remember as much as possible then I, I think I have to divide it into to shorter meetings and and more meetings, but, uh, but we started more or less from, from day one, also on the pitch, uh, uh, training in some patterns, some movements and so on. So it was um, more or less just uh, from day one we, we started. And I think it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great week. Um, it's a great, great group of players. We had some meetings, Ben and I, with especially the, the leaders of the group before we met. Uh, and before the, the whole group was in, just to, to make it clear how we wanted to, to, to move forward, how we wanted to play, how we wanted to create the environment around the, the, the group. So, so everything so far has been, uh, has been good, I would say. Is it difficult? Is it frustrating from a head coach's point of view that you want to just get going, that actually you haven't had all the players back yet? And it'll be a few weeks, won't it? Because Josh Sargent has been away yeah. at the, the Copper America, the new signing Cordoba has as well. So it's going to be two or three weeks yet before you've got everybody, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we still have the, the, the Scottish national team players uh, who will arrive next week. We have, of course, the guys who went to Copper America that will arrive in two weeks' time. Um, Shane Doffy came Friday and, and Adam came today. So... Uh, it's 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 how it is. Um, that's that's the football football world. That we have the time that we have, and instead of being frustrated with what we cannot do, then then focus on what, what we can do. And especially here, the first week and also this week now, um, it gives us the, the opportunity to see some of the younger boys. Uh, now they have had the chance. They have been in the in the session. They have been a part of the of the group so far here in the beginning. So it's it's good, and uh, and we get to know get to know everyone. So uh, no, it's yeah. okay. It's going to be a while before everybody's there. Um, in terms of what you're doing with the players, the traditional English pre-season is about just running and running and fitness work. Is that what it's been? I mean, it's not as hot as it usually is in pre-season. Have you been running them, or has there been a bit more to it than that? Uh, no, uh, we run because we play football. But uh, if we don't bring the football from day one, then 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 I don't uh, I don't get what we do. 
Um, so so that's that's a vital part of everything we do, and we can easily create drills where 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 they get the the running meters that they have to do. Uh, but we can we can put it into a context where it also makes sense in terms of the of the way that we're going to play. And that's the approach that we have every day. That that's that's how I see football. That's how the coaching staff see, sees football. That's we, we we simply need to 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 bring in the football every day. Um, so if they if if they were only there to run, then then it's a then they should have done or find something else to to do and uh, and and earn their money because we we a football club. It's football players, and that that's what we like. So so it's disguised running basically. Disg <laughs> running by stealth. Yeah, they are running, but they don't feel like they are because they've got football. Yeah, but we are but, but but we are intense and we are uh, everything is is planned down to smallest detail on everything we do every coach is involved when we train so the players they feel and, and that's also the feedback that we have got here from 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 the first week that they are they are tired and they also tired up here and that's uh that's a normal way of of, of starting preseason. but you can easily create intensity in training and, and and design drills so they they get the the meters that they, they they have to when you've got a clear idea of the way you want to play i'm sure part of that i mean i don't know is it determined by the players that you've got? Are there things that you want the team to do that you'll have to have the right players to be able to do? It's going to take time, isn't it? Everything in football takes time, but, but we have to, and that's the, that's the first task we have to, is, is to prepare these guys for the, for the first game in Oxford. Uh, that, that's, that's our duty for now, and, and we will do everything we can to make them as ready as possible. And we have to find that balance, so, so always, what can we do? What can we actually improve? What, we can, what can we develop? But also finding that balance on what can we actually perform today, and that's uh, that, that's that's the coach's task to find that balance always. But but we have of course to implement a, a a little bit new way of playing, and it will take time. But I see high quality in the group, and I see I see all really players now. We we just had a meeting with the with the offensive ones today after training, and they were they were really excited excited in in the way that we approach um, the game now because they can see they are much more involved. They we create even more chances. Uh, they have more offensive situations in the game. So for now, it, uh, it's okay. <laughs> it is, yes, it, when you haven't had any matches, it's, it's all possible still, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about in terms of your style of play? The, the, that's what the fans want to know. What, what can they expect to see on the pitch at Carrow Road in the new season? How, how would you sum it up? A team that is con in, in control for as close, close to 90 minutes as possible. Uh, I think... It's, it's not to be dis disrespectful for the for the national team here in here in, in, in this country here, <laughs> but uh, if I did like you did in the beginning, where I said, okay, winners of the group stage, more or less not conceding any any goals, even winning on penalty shootouts. <laughs> uh, I think to be fair, most people will say, ah, it's actually pr quite good, but still, I sense that the feeling of that national team is, ah, we need something extra. It it can actually be a little bit better, and I think that's that's also what we have to create here. Even though you mentioned last season's statistics, and it's for me also looking from outside, it, it 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 was okay to be fair, but we can do even better, and we can we can create that game where we create more chances, we are even more attacking in the things that we do, and we try to control even more in the games, and that will of course take time, but but I hope that it will be clear to see from from game one, maybe not here in preseason, maybe that will be times in, in the preseason games where we're not really close enough but we have to be when we are in uh, in the start of August but it will be a game where we hopefully control even more we have technical skilled players on pitch we have players that can dribble that can that can shoot that can uh, combine with each other um, always like I've said a, a couple of times now looking for for that next goal instead of being too defensive in the in our mindset then then see okay we are one up Let's go for the second one and the third one. That's the that's the mindset we we're going to play with. I'm glad I was going to come on to how close or not you are to your style of play is to the way England are playing because I think that's all in our minds at the moment. So I'm glad you mentioned it. So in terms of football supporters, they of course pay lots of money to go to matches. Your job is to win games first and foremost. But how much does it matter to you whether the football is being enjoyed, whether it's entertaining? Is that a big part of head coach's job or not? I think I spoke to the to the group on the on the training ground the other day, or I think it was first week about the environment and the culture that we try to create. And I think I know as a football coach, I have to win games. The team have to win games. We don't have to speak that much about it because everyone knows. That's just how it is. But what we can affect is what we do every day. And every day we meet in, we try to make it the best possible day. So the preparation needs to be 
uh, spot on every single day, but also the way that we approach each other. And, and that is to create some kind of, of belonging to this football club, whether it's a football player, whether it's a coach, whether it's, it's you guys out here. You need to go into that stadium every Saturday and, and have that feeling, this is my club, this is my team. And even though we lose, because that will of course happen in, in football, you can still walk away from the stadium having that feeling, okay, it was actually still my club. We lost, but, but, but we played okay, we played well, we tried, we gave it a shot. And I think that's, uh, that's that sense of feeling that, that we also, within the, the stuff that we do at the moment, have to create. So, so where does that come from then? What, tell me about your background growing up, watching football, being inspired by football. Who, who were the players for you that, that did that, that caught the imagination? Yeah, speaking of penalty shootouts, the, the, the first thing I really remember was in 94 where Roberto Baggio, he missed that penalty against Brazil. And that was really where I found out, okay, because I watched it in, in Italy and I, I saw how much football can really affect people. And, uh, and it was Italian fans really not in their best mood that, that evening. Um, and that was really the, the inspiration for me, the passion in football. And then I started to, of course, within the years to dig, dig more into the details, dig more into the leadership around being a football coach, uh, how much you can actually affect um, both on pitch but also outside. And here we sit and, and talk so much about transfers and players and, and so on. But, but being a football coach is also so much about leadership. There's also a group uh, outside the, 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 the pitch that needs to take care of the players every day and needs to be fully on board with everything we do, down to uh, principles of the game, but also the way that we approach the, f the, the physical part of it, the mental aspect as well. Uh, so it, it's a big, big task, but... but I like it. I'm inspired by leadership. I try to develop every day. I try to listen to, to leaders uh, where they can inspire from other parts of, of, of other industries and, and so on. So there's really so much in it where if I could wish for something, it is, then it will be that I, that I will be 100 years or 150 years because I want to be in football for as many years as possible. Fascinating. So who was your team growing up? Who did you support? Who did you go and watch? Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously from from Copenhagen, born and raised. Um, so, so the football team back then was was FC Copenhagen because it was it was five minutes from from where I grew up, and that's maybe also the the club. If you know a club from Denmark, maybe the club that you know. Uh, they performed okay in Champions League this season, and actually, the, I, I think they they beat Man, Man United. Uh, uh, but that was that was that club, and then going to Norseland, where I was for, for for nine years, it's it's of course also a big part of of who I am today and, and also a club that I will still support. So, so these are the, the other two I, I can mention. And how difficult do you think it will be to adapt to a, a new country, a new culture, a new, a new style of, of playing football? I know you'll have watched lots of championship football. You probably will have watched nearly all of Norwich's games from last season already. So yeah. wh how difficult do you think it's going to be to adapt? Uh, some of it will be difficult, some of it will be exciting, some of it will be interesting, some will be hard, uh, uh, hopefully also fun doing the way. Uh, that's how it is. I'm not in it for, for the easy stuff. If I was only here, so expected that everything will be easy, then it was maybe not for me. Uh, so, yeah, we. Uh, I have to wait and see. I think it's... It's football, I met the players and, and they have a, a, a very good understanding for, for what we're going to do and, and, and like I said, they feel very excited. Then of course it's a, it's a different country, it's a different league, uh, a little bit more, more games than I'm used to. <laughs> but, uh, but of course we also find out during the way, but if it was, if it was only easy then, then it will not be for me, so, uh, so um, we're ready to take on the task. What have you told him to expect, Ben? When, when you said, do you want to come and work in England, what, what did you say? How did you sum up what championship is like to work in? Yeah, I just said relentless, I think, was the first word that I said because, um, yeah, obviously, this is my first experience of, of it as well. Um, and, yeah, I think it helped me coming from a, a, a big club where I was used to sort of playing in European competition because that recreates a, a little bit the similar element of the amount of games that you play and a lot of midweek fixtures and stuff. So I think it, it sort of helps soften the blow for me. But, I, uh, yeah, look, Johannes watches a ridiculous amount of football um, so even before you know he he came here he knew so much about uh, championship and, and leagues all over the world to be honest so um, he was already pretty well informed but yeah I said the the schedule's relentless we play a lot of games um, 
But, you know, like I said, he's always, I think, been someone in his life up until now that wants to walk towards challenges and, and, and embrace them. And, 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 and like you just said there, and, and I agree completely, you know, if something's um, not a challenge or doesn't, you know, so, sort of make you feel a little bit uncomfortable as well, like that's, that's what living is about, right? Kind of testing yourself and, and walking towards those challenges and trying to find solutions to overcome them. So, yeah, I think... Uh, He's more than ready, so, so am I, and, and we know that it's going to be tough in some moments, um, you know, and, and, and we'll all need to, to have patience because you have to suffer in football, like within, within a game in 90 minutes, you know, although Johannes' sort of idea is to chase, chase the perfect game, and I think that's every pure coach, that's what they're all looking to do, but you know as well that realistically you're going to have to suffer in moments, and that's the same throughout the season. There'll be periods where it gets tough, where, you know, you you know it doesn't quite land for you and, and it's how you react in those moments and, and like I said all along our responsibility to deliver for you guys is to make sure that even in those moments you can see what we're trying to do you can see what we're all about you can relate to the way that we're playing and and, and you can walk away in those tough moments thinking yeah it was a difficult night tonight and we've not got the points but I can see what those guys are doing the, the boys never stopped running they were still proactive and positive in what they're doing and, and that's the responsibility of us to deliver for you guys so that even in the tough moments hopefully you can stay with us and, and understand what we're trying to achieve i don't think you have to tell anybody in here that there's a certain amount of suffering in watching a football club it, it comes with the territory doesn't it uh, we're going to take some questions from the floor in a moment so if anyone's got one bernie put your hand up and make sure you jo you attract uh, jack's attention jack's standing at the back there we've got one right down the front here jack so i'll let you come around the front and uh, we've had a few from people who couldn't be here tonight that they wanted asked so this is a good question for all three of you that came in from laurie today i'd like to ask the following question tonight could each of the panel give their thoughts on var We've got through half an hour without mentioning it. Uh, VAR is implemented by the Premier League and has the NCFC board ever discussed VAR? Now, we don't have to worry about that too much in the championship this season, but Johannes is, is smiling already. So VAR, are, are you glad it's not in the championship or do you wish it was there? I, 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 I <laughs> Again, my focus will always be on the, on the things that I can really affect. By the, and, um, I think we have to get used to it. Uh, it's just a way of using the system that obviously can be a little bit better, can be a little bit more efficient, but I think we have to get used to it. That's the, that's the development of, of the game. What I have to get used to is actually, I come from a league where there is VAR, uh, both in the, in, the, in the Danish league, but also we played Europe last season. A lot of games in Europe where there was obviously also VAR, so it's, it's the first time for some years now where I have to get used to, to playing games without that system. So actually now we can celebrate when we score a goal. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, and, that's maybe a good feeling. And, and that is almost the biggest problem with it, isn't it? I know it, yeah. it, it corrects some wrongs. It causes probably more controversy than it sells sometimes, Ben. But that, that moment of being able to celebrate a goal, I think something has been lost. Yeah, I'd agree. Look, I'm, I would say that I'm a purist when it comes to football. So those magic moments where, you know, someone scores a goal in a, in a key point in the game you just can't beat those that's what I think we all live for whether you're on the pitch doing it or you're in the stands kind of celebrating it so yeah 100 percent you know I hate those moments where you're in limbo you're not sure what's happening and then you almost have to celebrate again but it's just never the same that that moment's gone so I agree with Yanis. I think if if I had the choice between having VAR in its current form or not having it I'd probably say not have it, but I think if I had the choice of having VAR, but with a tweak in terms of the way that it's administered, then I would prefer that. Because I think, you know, we're, we're, we're playing for, for high stakes and, and I think it makes sense to try and get to a place where you can get, you know, big decisions right more often. Um, but as I said, in, in terms of its current form, I, I don't think it works. And if it was a choice between that or none at all, then I'd, I'd go back to the old school. So you've probably been at some of these meetings where it's in the Premier League days yes. in particular, when it's discussed whether or not VAR should come in or not. So what, what do you make of the way it's gone and the, the general feeling towards it? Yeah, obviously we had it when we were in the, in the Premier League and, and I completely agree with Ben. You lose something from the game um, having it and... And I, yeah, I mean, my, my personal view is that, that we haven't got it quite right in this country in, in, in how it's set up. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just correcting clear and obvious errors, which it was designed to do. It's 
kind of almost re-refereeing the game. And, and I think a lot of that is because there's pressure, because VAR is available, there's a lot of pressure then to almost re-referee the game. So, so I, yeah, I, I think we, we have discussed it uh, at EFL level uh, amongst championship clubs, and there's not a huge kind of hunger and appetite for it in its current form. There, there's talk that maybe if you know there's there's an adaptation or, or or we can get it to a point where it would be the right thing, but but for now it doesn't seem like it's on the table. I think most would agree that they're happy with not having it in the championship. Let's take some questions from the floor. If you, if you don't mind standing up, sir, we yes. can all hear what you've got to say. Jack will hold the microphone. Don't worry about that. Hi, my name is Mike. Welcome, Johannes, you. boss, gaffer. <laughs> I did watch the video. A couple of things. Um, you've talked very knowledgeably about um, how you've been getting the new players or the younger players, your new players, to adapt to your philosophy. Just wonder how... Did, did you have to use the same sort of philosophy with the new coaches and, and, and uh, the new guys coming in? And secondly, can I ask, <laughs> one of my pet hates, I hope we don't have to bring 11 players back for corners and, and free kicks, because that does my head in. And then while I'm on the, on the microphone, just one quick one for Zoe, any update on the uh, uh, expansion of the stadium that you can talk about? That's three questions. That wasn't that's bad. That's fine. Was that's it? good. There's a, there's a lot to go out there. And I, the one that stood out for me, I'm going to go straight to Johannes then. When Norwich defending a corner, yeah. <laughs> how, how many players are you leaving up? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately now we lost our our guy who's, who was in charge of that. Um, so uh, so we have to find our way. I would say we work with that based on some principles, so we can actually do the same stuff from game to game. But it also there can be variations in it where something and sometimes it can make sense to keep uh, players up but it, it all comes down to also uh, how good our keeper will be and how comfortable he will be in, in having more ground to cover with less players in also comes down to how good the opponent are in, in, in that specific area of the game so uh, we will always look very very careful into to, to uh, the team that we're going to play against and adjust small things regarding that but uh, First, we have to find the guy who's in charge of that. <laughs> yes, that was a bit, um, I'm sure you've heard, but there was a bit of news today that Andy Hughes, who uh, took responsibility for set pieces, amongst other things, he's left. He's joined Leicester. Ben, you, you'd have had the approach and done the deal, so sorry to see him go. Yeah, definitely. Hughes is uh, a, a big character. Um, obviously, played here and, and, and was much loved at the training ground, did, did some really good work, and, and like I said in the, in the press release, I think, his impact uh, was was there for everyone to see, um, but it was his energy and, and, and his his character and the relationships that he had at the training ground every day that we'll miss. But look, it's uh, part and parcel of the game, and and you know uh, we wish him nothing but the best. I'm sure he'll go and do great work. And, and yeah, look, it's a, it's a shame for us, but but we'll adapt as well. We're we're in the process now of just looking at that. Um, you know, there's 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 nothing done yet, but um, yeah, we'll we'll replace Susie and uh, somebody will come in because it's. Uh, so really key part of the game and, and something that, you know, we need to make sure that we've got um, the right things in place to, to ensure that we can optimise as well. And Zoe, the, the stadium expansion, there's been a lot of talk about that over the years, hasn't there, as to what the next step is, increasing the capacity, getting more people into Carrow Road. Where, where are you with that at the moment? Uh, if someone could do something about the price of steel, that would, <laughs> <laughs> that would be hugely helpful. And uh, yeah, at the moment, um, you know, we, ha we have plans, we've kind of master plans sort of development for for the whole stadium but in terms of kind of expanding the city stand it's just too cost prohibitive at the moment um just because of uh yeah like you know the cost of materials the cost of construction but it's something that we you know we constantly keep an eye on we're looking at you know can we adapt those plans to make it more cost effective uh, and, and it's also then looking at, is there other things that we can do within the, the current structure as well um, as we move forward? And there have been some changes. I got a glimpse inside the ground the other day, and you've got the rails up ready for safe standing for this yes. season, all across the lower tier of the Barkley, haven't you? And yes. if anyone's going to uh, see the Lionesses on, on Friday night, and that's the next game at Carrow Road, that'll be your first chance probably to, to see it and experience it. But that's all ready to go. That's in place, isn't it? Yes, yes. So that's, uh, yeah, it'll be ready for the game on Friday. 
great. That looks really good. It, do, it does actually, yeah. It, it looks great. Looking and we did we did have some in for the uh, for the final game, and uh, the feedback we got was really good. So hopefully it will uh, be welcomed. Yeah. So that's one change you'll see at Carrow Road. Your other point was about getting the coaches on board, wasn't it? So you had us back to you. So we talked about getting players on board with your style of play. You're working with a new coaching staff as well, aren't you? So you've got to take them with you on this journey too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and also, like I said before, it's uh, we talk so much about players, uh, but it's of course also staff, and it's it's club culture, and it's uh, everyone who's a part of this this uh, beautiful football club. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and we have had a lot of meetings to begin with. Um, uh, like I said, again, exciting times, and we started well, and and the feeling from day one also with the coaching staff is that they are they are really into this. We have a uh, beside the, the the Danish assistant coach, which who I know from from uh, so many years in Denmark now, so we know each other. Uh, but there's also a, a, a great Spanish assistant coach who's who's completely into this, and and really I think he's he's really excited about everything. Uh, the goalkeeper coach as well. Um, so we have had a lot of meetings, and every day also with the analysers and all the team around the the the, the club and the team, it's about also preparing them, of course, and they. I think actually quite fast they are they are into it. Uh, good to hear. Any other questions? Uh, we've got some hands up over there. Oh, Jack's right there. I think that's uh, uh, Richard's going to ask us a question. So Richard, are you able to stand up and uh, so we can all see you? Here we go. <laughs> yes, good evening to you all. Um, my question is I'm very enthusiastic about what's been said so far this evening, especially on the football side. But do you, as a panel, feel that we have all the personnel in place to achieve that in the coming season? Are the personnel in place? I suppose, do you mean playing-wise? Playing-wise in terms of achieving everything you've talked about? Yeah, look, I think um, we've got a really talented squad. Uh, we're clear on that. Um, you know, we've got some top players. We've got a really nice blend as well of, of some really talented younger players and some really experienced um, professionals that have sort of been there and done it and played at, at the highest level. So we feel really good about um, the quality of the group. I think that's been nice for Johannes this past week to work with a lot of those as well and almost kind of validate that, um, which, was, which was nice for me to hear because, look, Johannes has, has worked with top players in his career before and he's developed players for the absolute highest level of the game. Um, so for him to come in and, and work with our group and feel really good about um, what he's got at his disposals, um, of course, great. Um, so, yeah, we feel like we're in a good place. Um, of course, recruitment's always um, important. So the first step is always to evaluate the group we've got. That's, of course, ongoing. Johannes has worked with, with those that are back now for a week. As we mentioned before, there's players coming back all the time from international duty. So that process of evaluating the group will... will kind of be continual um, but of course we're active as well kind of in the market we have to be that's of course a big focus of my work um, there are some areas that, that we're really interested in and active in like I said left back is one of those um, but yeah by and large we feel really good about about the players that we've got and I think uh, you know we've got a high technical kind of level in the squad which um, will certainly help kind of playing in the style that Johannes wants but I would say even more important, honestly, than the technical level uh, for a game model like Johannes's and, and like the one that we want to implement is, is the capacity to take on information as well. And, and from that cognitive standpoint, it's often a misconception that, that I hear a lot is people feel like to play in a certain style of play, you have to have players that are unbelievable technically. And of course, a, a solid technical foundation is always important, but probably more important than that in a, in a complex game model is to have players that can take on information, that can see pictures, that can solve solutions um, at pace on the field. And, and we've got players that can do that. We've got a great group that want to learn, that have got the right attitude to, to take on information and apply it. And we've already seen that in, in the last week. Um, so yeah, we, we feel in a good place. Of course, you know, there'll be, uh, there'll be additions as the summer goes, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, but I think we're, we're in a really good position to start with, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned left back there. There were two senior left backs left and no one's come in in that position yet. So there are some obvious gaps in the squad. 
And you mentioned already that it's a necessity that if you get the right offer for a player, players might go. So I don't know what fans think here, but I can't stand here now and, and give you any certainty what I think the Norwich team is going to look like on the first day of the season. There's a lot of work still to do, isn't there, this summer? Yeah, of course. Like the summer markets are always busy. Um, you know, that, it's the same at every club. There's always lots going on. It's, of course, the, the window where the majority of, of, of transfers take place. Um, so, yeah, we, we're, we're definitely very active. Um, yeah, of course, left backs are, uh, you know, an area for us with, with, with two senior le left backs having left, like you said. Um, but ultimately, you know, us making the right decisions and bringing in the right players uh, for the right deals is the most important thing for us rather than the time and, and, and making a, a hasty decision that might not necessarily be the right one or, or an optimal one. So, yeah, we're, we're still in a, in a great place. I would say as well, the other bit of context that's important for, for people to understand is whenever you have big international competitions in a, in a summer, that, that also has an impact on the market. You tend to see that it can slow uh, the conditions of the market down in the early stages because you know, ultimately a, a lot of movement in, in, a, in the market is created by, by clubs right at the, at the highest level. And, and typically when players are away competing in, in major sort of international tournaments, that can, can sometimes lead to the market being a little bit slower because the, you know, the players aren't moving, money isn't filtering down the market. So yeah, we, we're in a really good place. We've, we've, we've been preparing for this for a long time. And yeah, I think we're, we're starting from a good position, but of course we're active and, and, and yeah, there'll, there'll be things that we do as the window progresses to make sure that we're, we're in a great place come um, the 10th of, uh, of August. Uh, where's our next question coming from? We've got one down the front, one behind you as well, Jack, that you haven't seen. So I'll, uh, that one's slightly closer. So while you go and get that question, I'll ask you one that came in online. Uh, it's uh, one here. Let's go to Zoe from, uh, from, from Shane Jones here, who says, Norwich City are proud now to have safe standing in the Barclay, as we've mentioned, and in the Snake Pit. Uh, what, uh, again, what's the situation uh, towards expanding Carrow Road? You, you've covered this a little bit already, but do, just expand if you can on extending the city stand we've talked about are there other areas of the ground where you feel you can perhaps add a few more seats in it's it's, it's difficult isn't it because you've mentioned yeah. the price of steel being an issue that's wherever you try to do it that's going to be a problem isn't it yes it is i think it's more around um how we can possibly develop the offering within the stadium so we we do have some air we we sort of have some areas within the stadium uh, that are kind of underutilized so that maybe we could kind of build out better facilities for supporters um, for the match day so it would be it would be more around developing the facilities rather than actually adding seats if we don't do an expansion yeah, it's, a, it's a difficult task let's take the question from the, the back of the room there I'll hold the mic okay um, I've supported Norwich since about 1981-82 and um, I think you're talking a good talk but before ever balls kicked in the championship we are always going to be at the level we are one of the better supported, one of the better financed, one of the better organised teams and we do have those international players so for me as a fan this feels a bit of a sense of deja vu I mean most teams say they're attacking teams now but what do we need to improve on? I think we got to the point we did realistically as a club last season, but what do we need to improve on to get further? Because, like I said, before a ball's even been kicked in the championship, we're one of the stronger sides there. We should be in that top six. We should be challenging for the premiership. Now, I know the premiership's changed a lot in my lifetime. There's a lot more money at the top. It's more difficult when you get there to stay there. But realistically, what do you need to improve? Because... Yeah, you need to change some of the players, but I think some of it is issues like the mentality. You have a very good ground, but it just feels, as a fan for me, the last 10 or 15 years, we could have been having this conversation five or 10 years ago, and money span around players and managers have come and gone, but we've just not quite got that sort of X factor, if you like. That's I think that's a, an interesting question. Um, ben, you mentioned this earlier on, the ambition to turn Norwich into a, an established Premier League club down the line. So many people have had that ambition and they've got close. We've had lots of times where Norwich have got up there but not managed to stay. So what is missing? I think that was the basis of your question, wasn't it? What, what is the missing ingredient that, that Norwich have never had and why they've never been able to do it? Look, so many things. Like it's, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's lots of different things that can, that can get you to that place. 
but hopefully then have enough to be able to achieve our sort of ambition, which, like we said, is to be established at that level. So it's, there's not just one solution. A, a lot of it, I think, is about the way in which, the point at which you can get to, at the point you can achieve promotion. Um, you need to be arriving at that point with the squad in a certain place in terms of the composition of the group, the experience of the group, the development of the players. You know, you need to be arriving at that point with those conditions right that mean that, you know, you're, you're not necessarily having to completely overhaul the squad in one summer and change everything. And, you know, so I think trying to make incremental steps, like if you look at, you know, classic examples of clubs that have managed to do it, like a Brentford, for example, you know, Brentford didn't have huge spikes in performance where they went from, you know, from League One to, to the Premier League in two years. They, they incrementally got better by, you know, um, developing players, having to go through a natural cycle of, of sometimes moving them on, but slowly getting better, being, being more competitive, more consistent year on year and building to the point where, you know, they had disappointment in the playoffs and, 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 and failed, uh, even though I hate that word, um, but they came back and, and they're in a position where you could see the progress of a club like that over multiple years. That's kind of the approach that, that we want to take. It's not about a flash in the pan where, you know, we sign one big pay, player for a huge fee and think that that's going to solve all of our problems. It's, it's trying to approach things in a methodical way where we look at absolutely every part of our football operation. So the way we develop players, the way we attract players, the way that we uh, build them as athletes, the way that we make them more robust as people, the way that we can implement a game model that can give us more controlling games, that stacks the probability in our favour more than maybe it has done in the past. And, and these are all things that, that take time, that, that there's not uh, you know, a one quick fix that's uh, one lever that you need to pull or one player that you sign or one change in formation or, or one head coach that's just going to achieve that for you. It's, it's a process that that yeah, takes a lot of work and, and that's what we're focused doing every day. You know, there's, there's lots of changes going on around the club. Um, of course, there's changes in our, in our player development um, structure in terms of, of, of personnel that are involved. New head coach, we've got a new head coach on the women's side. We're doing lots of work culturally, um, lots of things that we're trying to do to create a strong identity, a strong um, you know, way of approaching football that, that you guys can hopefully relate to because you guys play a huge part as well and I think what excites me is having been here now for a, for, for a decent period of time you know I think the connection that we can build with with everyone in this room and you know all of our other fans both in the local community but all over the world I think there's levels and levels that we can get to beyond where we are in terms of that and that responsibility is on us we have to deliver that for you. We have to give you the clarity. We have to bring you on the journey to inspire you, to hopefully not feel like ah, this is the same old thing that we've seen five years ago, 10 years ago, two years ago. Um, and listen, we understand more than anyone that at the moment a ball's not been kicked. It's easy to say this, that or the other. We have to deliver now. And, and again, that's, that's not something that will happen in one game uh, in Oxford. It, it, it will take... A period of time to to hopefully deliver things that you can see and feel and and bring you on the journey with us because until we can do that and really leverage the power that every one of you has in this room and in the stadium and in the city we won't achieve what we want to achieve because I've, I've lived through that with clubs before where you know we've not had that connection and and we've all seen other clubs that have been able to build it you know I, I remember going up to Anfield many many times with Arsenal where you almost felt like before the game had started, you were, you were two or three nil down because the connection that they had between the, the supporters and the team was, was so powerful. Zoe worked there, was so powerful that it, it, was, it was formidable for, for any team to go to that stadium and try to compete. And, and that's the kind of journey that I want to go on. And there was, there was moments last year, you know, you think of the derby, you think of um, the home leg against Leeds where I was sat there, you know, hairs on the back of your neck are standing up and I'm thinking, this is what we can create. This is the kind, of, the, the kind of atmosphere, the kind of connection, the kind of unity that we can build going forward. And, and that's on us to deliver it. But like I said, time will, will tell. And, and, and you know, I don't ask that you, you judge us now after uh, you know, a press conference and a week's training. It's, we have to deliver things going forward. And, and all I would ask is that you stick with us and, and judge us in time. Because like I said, that's the journey that we'll go on. And, and I'm, I'm confident that we can deliver that. I think Johannes wanted to come in on one of the points you made there. Yeah, just, just two points because it's, um, it's a good question, of course. Um, first of all, it's tough business uh, competing in the championship and, and 
hopefully also in the Premier League. That's that's just how it is. That's the name of the game. Uh, or what's the playoff final? Leeds Southampton. It's it's decided by one goal. One team will will be a Premier League team next season. One team will be a Championship. So it's it's down to this sometimes. Uh, second of all, I think there is areas where we can improve and where for us to be that club that you that you wish we can be, um, uh, we can build on these areas where where not all the other clubs clubs will do the same. I think if you guys you close your eyes and think about one or two clubs that are well driven and do things a little bit different compared to all the others, but they ex they actually manage to compete. There's several clubs in in Italy. There are also some. Ben just mentioned Brentford here in England, where they actually manage to compete, but they do things just a little bit different. Um, that's also what we're going to do. We have to build, and that's what started here from day one, we have to build a, a very, very clear style of play, how we want to approach games, how we want to approach developing young players, developing young talent, how we want to uh, do trainings, how we want to create the culture, the environment, how we want to behave, how we want to... Uh, give feedback to each other and so on. If we have that, and it will take time, but if we create that and it's it's detailed and it's 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 good work, then it can also be work that we can continue building on. So uh, in five years' time, it will be even better. And at some time when you are tired of me, maybe after five years, and you all you guys in here will smile on your faces, but in five years' time, you say, please get rid of this guy. And then uh, someone new will come in. Uh, but he will not, ins instead of changing everything, he will start building on the things that are already there. And that's the way that we can actually uh, uh, hopefully achieve at some point Premier League, but also be able to compete on uh, not just for one season, but, but five and ten and fifteen seasons. A uh, couple of questions down in front here, Jack. Yeah. Uh, some really good points here. Just following on from that conversation, so what is realistically success for us next season? Because, ironically, I was probably relieved we didn't get promoted last season um, just because of what you just said around that sustainability of quality and that whole sort of yo up and down. So going back to what you just said, is it about building that culture for this season and getting to a place where we really do understand the identity of the club? You know, or is it actually about getting promoted in this next season? Or is that more of a longer-term plan to, to make sure we stay there rather than this topsy-turvy situation we've had for many years so far? That's a good question. Um, look, I think football's a special game, right? It's, it's one of those games, industries, things that what brings us to it is the margins are so fine, like Johannes was talking about. And it's such a low-scoring game that we know as well that probably 30% of the time, the score of a game is not representative of performance. And so therefore, it's really important in our work that we focus on the process because we can't control the outcome a lot of the time. You know, there's, there's another team on the pitch that are trying to stop you doing everything that you want to do. And there's also somebody dressed in the middle, usually in black, that can turn the game in a moment with what we might perceive to be a ridiculous, crazy decision. So, you know, Johannes has spoken a lot actually in, in the training ground and also with, with our staff at the stadium in the past week or, or so. And, and so many times in, in football, I hear people uh, talk about the result and winning and promotion and all of those things and I get it and that's so important and that's always our target but as well we have to focus on the process because that's what we can control and and ultimately our ambition is to go into every game to try and win it and that, that's what we'll be doing next year you know but to get to that point we have to go onto the pitch every day in training to try and train to win as well to, to approach everything in in the best possible way to optimize the way that we're trying to play, the way that we're trying to develop, the way that we're trying to behave, the culture we're trying to create, all of those things. So, you know, it might sound a boring answer, but ultimately our target is always, of course, a club like ours, when, when we're playing in the championship, of course, we're always trying to uh, get promoted and, and reach the Premier League. Um, but as well, rather than think too much about an outcome that we're not necessarily in full control of, we can control what we do every day, the way we approach games, training, and you know, trying to win every single game that we play. We're realistic. We know that, like Johannes said, it's it's a tough tough business at this level of the game. It's a relentless league that, you know, quite frankly, probably at the start of of a championship season like the one that we're going to embark on, there's there's probably 15 clubs that that, that think that they genuinely have a realistic chance of going up. Um, so we know the challenges that await us and how difficult it will be.
but rather than sort of set our sights on, on an outcome that we might not be able to control or we can't control, uh, we focus on the process, but with a target always in our mind. Um, so that's always what we strive for, but it's the daily habits, the daily behaviors, and the daily approach that we'll take that is, is what we'll spend most of our energy trying to, trying to achieve and, and, and control. I think we've got time for just what a couple I, more questions. There's one down here. Sorry, Janice. What, what I can guarantee that we're one of these 15 clubs. <laughs> <laughs> one out of 15. We'll take that, definitely. Um, got some, a few more questions to rattle through. Here we go. How can we can they improve away form is the first question. The second is, would it be possible to install lifts in the stands? More lifts in the about stands. Difficult. Zoe, More I think that's for you. Stands. More lifts in the stands for supporters. That's a difficulty just because of the construction of the stands and kind of retrofitting anything. But it's definitely something we will look at as part of the wider plan. Excellent. Um, more questions. We've got several questions over this side, Jack. We've got one over here as well. So let's. Uh, there's a man who's very enthusiastic there, w waving his. Uh, not sure what he's waving, but here he is anyway. Hello, Johannes. Hi. Copenhagen is a wonderful city. The it mermaids is. are so small. <laughs> <laughs> and Tivoli is so expensive. You agree? Anyway, newspaper reports. You've been reported to say you're looking at the Adam Ida situation after training. I don't know what's true, whether it's uh, newspaper reports or not. But I ask you, how do you assess whether you keep him or not? You've got the video, you've got training, you've got friendlies. What can you achieve by that? Cannot you not rely on the people you've already got in the club? You've got Neil Adams, who's been in the club a million years. You've got Mr. Napper, the statistics guru. You can see by statistics, he doesn't score goals for Norwich City. He doesn't score goals for Ireland. So it really is quite a simple decision. And I think, first of all, it's a bit of a test for you. In the next couple of weeks, you keep him or not. And if you don't keep him, and I have no authority, you have 70 years supporting, but sometimes supporters do know players initially better than management. So I believe, from my point of view, you're under extreme pressure to make a decision now or tomorrow. He wants to know about Adam Eden. Is he staying or going? I think that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the first bit and I don't know if Johannes wants to chip in as well but, but look from, from my perspective um, yeah we probably see the situation a bit different um, Adam's a fantastic player um, I think yeah if you look last season um, at the point in which uh, maybe we arrived in the winter Adam's goals per minute was one of the best in Europe. Um, you know, he was coming off the bench and impacting games um, in big moments as well, by the way. Um, so, you know, I think that he's a, a proven goal scorer at championship level. And then you saw what he did in a short space of time as well at a, at a huge club in, in, in the SPL. So, yeah, I disagree in that sense. And I think when you look at, at everything that, that Adam brings to the table in terms of his age, his athletic capability, his power, his ability to destabilize a, a defensive line and run behind, which is, which is um, an, in, an invaluable sort of skill in a number nine in the modern game. Um, he's a full international, he's homegrown, he's come through our, through our system. Um, you know, Adam is exactly the kind of player that, that excites me. Um, so... And yeah, look, he, he, uh, he returned today, actually. Uh, it was his first day back in the building. He had a, um, a little bit of a staggered break because he was away on international duty. Um, and I know that, yeah, although today was just a, a day really for him with the conditioning team to, to, to get back into things, I know that Johannes is, is of course, really excited to, to work with him as well and, and obviously has followed him closely on, uh, through his previous time with the club, but also whilst he was on loan. Yeah, so uh, the, your part of the question was, how, how do you know when you're watching a player in training, do you make the decision yourself as to, I want to keep him, I, I'm not sure about this one, or do you talk to the other yeah, yeah. No, 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 I will never do anything, just, just myself. We, we, we are a team, and also the way that we approach uh, everything that we do is, is it's we, it's us playing, it's not, it's not my team, it's, it's our team. Uh, Copenhagen is a beautiful city, but you, you wasted your time watching that little mermaid, so... <laughs> Uh, I can give you some uh, some information after after here because there's there's some areas where you have to go there you have to see and it's the same with football players we have different opinions 
and there's some fans I could hear here where they like Adam. Maybe you're not his biggest fan, uh, but but uh, and that's that's totally fair. I would say I would give him a fair chance. Sometimes when you see players from outside where hmm, they're maybe struggling a little bit, they're maybe not performing on what you can expect them to be able to do. It's it's not necessarily the player you have to fix. It can also be the environment you have to fix. Uh, and that that I think is the that's an approach I think it's it's important to look at it. and it can be that you're right let's see but I will give him definitely a, f a fair chance and I think in training we get a lot of answers and we have him for that's the the benefit of going here it's in in Denmark the summertime is, is so short we have a three week preseason he is six so it's it's double time of, of what I'm used to so there is time we have friendlies we have training sessions and the way that we train is is uh, is to improve our game model. So we will have situations in training that will be more or less similar to game situations, and we can we can easily find out whether he he can adapt, whether he can learn, wh whether he can fit into a system. And again, so many players they didn't function well in in one system, but function very well in another system. Uh, so it's it's definitely for for us to find out. But it's a it's a wee thing, but we give him definitely a fair chance. Let's uh, see if we can whiz through a couple of other questions. They've put the lights on here, you see. I think they're, uh, they're turning the heat up on us. We're looking forward to seeing your new style of play at Norwich City in the first team. I was just wondering how that dribbles down into the academy. Will they also be playing um, the Ioannis style? And where do you strike the balance of players staying in the academy to learn that, as opposed to going out on loan and playing a, a different style at another club? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, and this is going to be a, a, yeah, a huge focus of our work going forward. So, you know, there were many reasons why we chose to, to recruit Johannes, but style of play was, was, was one of the biggest, maybe the biggest. Um, and it's important now that, um, that, you know, that, that was a decision that we made consciously because it aligns with the way I see football, the way that we want to play as a club. Um, it's the way that we think will give us the best chance of being successful, but also to develop players. But it's really important now that we create that as a, as a one club approach, uh, because yeah, one of, one of the observations I made when I first joined the club was we didn't really have that. There was no, I didn't feel, um, certainly in the last seven or eight months that I've been here, we probably lacked um, a consistent approach to how we see football, how we talk about football, how we develop football players, the language we use, how we train, every day on the pitch and my dream is to get us all together to a position where yeah you, you can come and watch our first team at Carroll Road or you could watch our, our women's team at Carroll Road or you could come and watch any one of our junior teams throughout the pathway and of course there's always going to be differences in, in each of those different contexts but I want there to be key themes where you can clearly see that's how Norwich play football that's how they approach the game and that's what we have to build. So 100%, um, we're definitely not there yet. That starts now. And that's a process that will take time. But that's why we recruited a coach like Johannes. And that's why we've recruited an assistant head coach like Glenn Riddersholm. Because these are guys that, um, A, have got the competency to, to, to do that. But B, have got the passion to come in and, and yes, work within the, the realities of, of what we all know being the first team head coaches, which is to win games and, to, and to, to, to push us forward, but also to approach things every day that allow us to, to build everything behind that from an infrastructural perspective in the club more broadly. So yeah, that's definitely the goal. That's what we're working to every day. And of course, a new head of, of football development who we're very close to announcing probably tomorrow will play a big part in that as well. Um, alongside all of us, myself, Neil Adams, technical director plays a key part as well so collectively together that's our the focus of our work going forward let's take another question hi you, you touched on it very briefly about man in, man in the middle the man in black now clearly we all know the rules and i'm sure each season start of season you get sort of guidance from above about the new rules and how it's being interpreted but do we do anything more with sort of the refereeing side of things. Because I remember like 10 years ago, we gave away five penalties in five games and we got a referee consultant to sort of come in and try and work out what was going wrong. And I mean, I'm not talking about like getting Clattenburg as Forest sort of idea, but um, <laughs> do we do have any more sort of liaison with referees so they can kind of say, well, 
yeah, if you do it, don't do it quite like this, then you won't get the foul, or yeah, is that it's separate? A, it's a really good question. Um, so look, it's, it's a part of our opposition analysis process. Um, so it is something that, that we do look at. Of course, we don't um, take ages to go into depth on that because of course there's, there's other sort of more pressing parts of the game that we want to prepare for. But yes, of course, our analysts look at who's the referee, what are their tendencies, have we had them before, what was the feeling from the game, are they somebody that you know, is, um, can pull cards out easily, are they someone that's a bit more free-flowing. So it is part of our process and something that we do do work on. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting part of the game. Obviously, uh, yeah, the Premier League club that, that you didn't mention, but you referred to a situation, obviously tried to do something quite innovative in that space, which, um, yeah, I don't think quite, quite worked out. But it's definitely an area of the game that, that I think as a, as, a, as a sport more broadly, we can probably think about. Because if you go to, for example, rugby, it's a huge part of the game. You know, they work a lot of the week preparing for exactly how the referees, you know, approach the game, what their tendencies are, and, and the captains will do a lot of work in terms of their preparation around that. So it's certainly something that we do work on, but we need to be mindful of whether we do more going forward, because I think probably it's an area of the game more generally in football that we can probably look to other sports and, and build upon. Uh, let's take one more question, and uh, we've got one. Uh, there's a gentleman here who's had his hand up for a while. We'll take one more Sorry, question. Jay, come come in, we'll have a few final thoughts. Uh, yeah, hi, Duncan, um, season ticket holder for over 20 years. Um, Johannes, I really like what you're describing, your style, potentially, of what we might see. Um, you talk, and Ben, you talk about dominating a game. So that sort of implies possession football. Now, we have seen some possession teams that are actually quite boring, sort of passing it from side to side. So in order to score, and I know you want to score, Johannes, so... That involves a certain amount of risk. Yeah. So what is your balance between security and safety and possession and risk? And then the other thing I wanted to ask you was, which I really loved, you said, if we go 1-0 up, we're going to go and see if we can get 2-0 up or 3-0 up. But say we're 1-0 up at home, 20 minutes to go. You know, the, the lot of talk is about um, game management. Do you then fall back and try and protect the 1-0 lead or just a couple of questions I'm interested to hear your answer for. Yeah. Uh, first, it is a risk and it's also, if we look at some of the better teams in the, in the world right now, there's, there's still these moments in the game where also for me it can be a little bit boring uh, to watch and that's, that's obviously the risk when you try to, to dominate the game as much as possible. Uh, to be fair, I'd rather go that, down that road instead of saying, okay, we just give the ball away. And then it's 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 more up to duels. It's more up to random situations. And and the way that that, that I and we gonna approach the game is is that it has to be not random, but as many situations in the game that we can actually control and that we can actually train. So so the way that we see things is that that we can train everything in football, and we can prepare these these players for more or less every situation in football. And that's the approach that we're going to have. There is a risk that sometimes it can be a little boring. I will, I will go the other way and say, OK, with these 46 games in the league, maybe it's also OK sometimes to be up 2-0 and they just keep the ball for the rest of the game. Uh, I hope you can live with it, um, if, that's the, if that's the case once in a while. Uh, but it's, of course, about finding that balance, and that's also what we, what we train at the moment. So, so we still have that mindset to score that next one, because it is important for us. To be fair... There will be games also where it, uh, it can be different reasons for that, but, but sometimes we need to sit back a little lower and to defend. can also be okay once in a while to open more, more space for counter-attacks, and if you have fast players up front, they will have even more space to run into. So uh, you will see that we approach the game in, in a, uh, hopefully, a very obvious way, but of course, we should we should always be be ready to adapt also from outside when the while the game is on. So, at the end of the day, it's the result that matters. But uh, I hope if it's boring once in a while that you uh, that you uh, can live with the with the approach. But even in even in those moments where you know if if you see it with like Johannes said, some of the top teams that really dominate and control both possession but also territory, they sustain attacks. Often, of course, they'll force an opposition 
by way of that into a low block and then it becomes a challenge then of how do you penetrate a low block it's difficult when a team has 11 players behind the ball maybe a defensive line of of six because they have a back four their two wide players drop in to be a, a a lateral line of six in the in the defensive line and and that's also where it's our responsibility as well to convey to you what we're trying to do because as well in those moments we want you to understand the challenge we're facing and and how that you know, if we're in that position, it's probably because we've done a really good job of dominating and controlling. But then it's about you having an understanding of how we might try and, uh, and, and kind of solve that problem then. Maybe we're looking to draw them out with some short passes that can bring them out and, and try to then create spaces. So, yeah, that's why it's really important that I think we try to bring you on the journey with us on both a, a higher level in terms of transfer strategy, club strategy, approach to, to things in a big picture, but also on a tactical level as well and, and you know Johannes is a coach that I think is really open in that respect so yeah hopefully it's, it's on us to bring you on that journey with us so even in those moments you'll still find some joy in, in seeing how we're approaching that and what we're trying to do to provoke a certain situation to then try and find a solution and capitalise. Uh, I think that just about brings us to a close because we're, we're football fans. We're only built for about 90 minutes. We can't, we can't do any longer than that. And we're, we're nearly at that point now. And I know uh, Yanis is happy to stay and sign some autographs as well. Uh, at the end, the, the, the club have got some cards over there that he, he's happy to sign. He's already, I've, I've seen Yanis having a look in the great uh, On The Stall City. We've got to say hello to the Bowles family. We've got their uh, On The Stall City shop open uh, over to my left-hand side. What great work they do. And I should just say, we're... They're not just here tonight. We, I'm lucky enough to work in this building where our studios are, and every day I get tempted by all the array of great Norwich City memorabilia and shirts they've got in there. So if you're ever in the city, make sure you pop and see them. I saw Johannes in there earlier. Any, anything you liked in there? Did you buy anything? I'm just, um, like Ben, he started saying that he's a football fan. I'm a football fan too, so uh, I needed to see these retro shirts and, uh, and, and because I have a collection back home as well. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's, just, it's always interesting to see, so... That was the reason. We've got some great Norwich retro shirts just in the audience tonight as well. And uh, if you if you haven't got the, the new one yet, that's uh, that's available over there with the Community Sports Foundation team who are here as well. Um, I'm just going to finish, I think. We ought to let Johannes have the last word tonight because uh, this is your first chance to properly meet supporters, <laughs> get across your point of view, what you want them to take away from tonight. So you've done this with the players, with the coaches already, a bit of a message to start the season. What, what do you want to say to the oh, supporters? That was, that was a difficult one. I hope that we more or less spoke about everything. but But... Uh, to be fair, also to, to the questions, I, I sense that there's something wrong with these referees in this in this country. But the, uh, <laughs> I prefer to talk about football. So that's also what you uh, what you will see from me, both before games and after games. That we dig into some details and, and we try to be as honest as as possible. So some will be good, some will will, will not be good enough, and we have to be better and, and to improve. And that's also the the way that, that I work and that we have to work, that we, ha we try to be as open as possible and we, we discuss how much we can open up uh, also for you guys so you have an, a, a good understanding of, of what we do so we, at the end of the day, can create that sense of belonging like I spoke about initially, that every time you go to the stadium you have that feeling of this is my team that I'm going to watch today and even though we lose or draw or whatever, you still go from the stadium with the, with the same kind of feeling. And for that, we have to create a, an open environment um, I'm brought up with a grandmaster in my former club, which he always said that the more the, the other teams they know about us, the better we just have to be. Uh, I'm not sure I will open up that much as he did, because that was <laughs> more or less just handing out the starting 11 the day before. Uh, that was a little bit, a little bit too crazy, but, but, but I get the message, I get the point. So it's for us always to develop, always to improve, always to be as, as good as we can be, but also to give you guys as much as possible because at the end of the day, if you're, if you're not there to support us, what is it worth then? So, uh, so I, I hope we, we, we could bring just a little bit of that feeling into, into the fan forum here tonight because that was, that was the initial plan. So uh, you came with smiles. I hope, also hope you leave with smiles. So... <laughs> Well, it's great. It was great seeing you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who's come along tonight and to everyone who's been involved, to Jack and to Alistair and Anthony who've been in charge of all the technicals and, and making this work, and to you all for coming. And most of all, let's have a final round of applause for our panel, to Ben, to Zoe and to Johannes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Enjoy the season.